Neil here and welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com with a podcast where we discuss high intensity strength training and provide you with the tools, the tactics and strategies to grow your strength training studio business. This is episode 333. The topic today we're going to focus on is studio size. How do you decide on the size of your location for your strength training studio business? Um, and the reason I think this is important is because there's probably a few filters that I think we should be thinking about when deciding on the size of our location. Maybe those filters are the strategy of our business, our brand, our vision, um, maybe the referral power of our, um, our business, and maybe how a studio size impacts that, as well as obviously things like resources, You know, simply how much money do you have when you get started? and things like that. Um, and I couldn't think of anyone better to talk about this with than Discover Strength CEO and founder, Luke Carlson, um, who I think is probably the best person for this because we recently did a podcast on your micro studio experiment. And we talked about a wonderful comparison you did, which was so interesting, uh, comparing your, your micro studio business uh, with one of your larger, more regular sized studios. And the differences in revenue and success were astounding. And I learned so much from that. Uh, and you've also opened studios of all shapes and sizes. So I think you're, you're re really well placed to talk about this. So Luke, welcome back and excited to get into this with you. My pleasure, Lawrence. Thank you for having me. So I thought we would kick off with like a filters for this, or, or we can start wherever you like. But when thinking about studio size, the first thing that came up for me was what are the filters that help you make that decision on what square footage is appropriate for your business? But would you start somewhere else? I think that's a great question. Um, yeah, let's get right into the filters. How, how do you even make this decision? Yeah, so, so what, what, what's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I think the first filter is is begin with the end in mind. And and the end doesn't have to be the very end, but begin with the end in mind means what do you want your business to look like, you know, two or five years from now? And what that specifically means is how many trainers are going to be on the floor, right? And um, how long is a session? How many people do you want to uh, get through the doors in a day? And are you offering just a one-on-one -on -one service? Is there a small group service? Do you want to have the flexibility to add something like that um, down the road? So, so often we are a one-on-one -on -one trainer ourselves. We're really good at it. And we think if I can just get this many square feet and this much equipment, I can start doing one-on-ones in this space. And then we didn't have the foresight or the planning to say, well, I really, to make this work, want to have you know X number of trainers on the floor at one time. I would love to do some group sessions. Or hey, based on where my business is located and other factors, I tend to be way busier earlier in the morning or in the afternoon. And if I could actually have five trainers on the floor in those busy times, I could see a lot more people, right? So it's, it's uh, one thing to say I can have two clients and two trainers in a facility at one time. And if I'm open for 12 hours in the day and it's 30 minute workouts, you know, essentially there's 48 slots available. Well, yeah, that's if everybody wants to work out with with uh, an evenly distributed interest in terms of schedule timing all day long. So can you predict or do you have an understanding of what that traffic pattern will look like? And and I think that's different in different markets and I think it's different in different locations. So the, the filter I would start with is, well, what am I trying to build? And I don't mean BHAG and you know what's the purpose of the organization. I mean, what am I trying to build in terms of what's actually on this exercise floor? That's the first filter. The second filter is, well, what's the actual training methodology look like? Because size is so much determined by training methodology. And I think that most of your listeners are going to have a similar training uh, methodology and some uh, similar modalities, uh, types of equipment, et cetera. So that maybe that conversation is not as interesting, but man, it really changes if your training approach is, is different and you need a strip of artificial turf for people to do speed and agility things and you need more space for a, a, a platform to do some um, deadlifts and some power cleans. And at this point, I should just probably stop talking because most of your listeners are not interested in that, but <laughs> very, very common in training studio setups. And we should be aware that there's successful training studios outside of just high intensity training studios. And there's something to be learned from them and it, it might not be exercise selection, but um, in terms of their physical spaces, I still think we could potentially learn. 
Yeah, I've made a note here about layout, which I think we'll get into as well, um, because otherwise this this podcast is going to probably be like five minutes long. Um, So we'll certainly elaborate on that in a moment. Um, So no, I love that. That was a great start. I guess maybe it's a bit um, obvious, but I guess one of the other filters is what resources one has, right? If you're planning on opening a studio in an expensive location, um, then obviously you're somewhat restricted if you have low resources. Um, So that's also obviously going to going to affect the the size of studio you can afford to invest in in the beginning. I would Maybe redefine that. I'd redefine that filter as as are you well capitalized? Because if your business model and your plan is I'm making this up is to have five trainers on the floor and you say well I don't have the resources for that so I'm going to do a smaller uh, uh, location. Well, hold on. With your choice, your your choice and location didn't align with what your actual plan was. And you let finite resource get in the way of that. So what's your job there? Your job, the entrepreneur's job, is to secure the capital to be able to execute the business plan. So the most powerful uh, filter first is what's the plan? And so, and, and by the way, the most rudimentary business plan is you show month by month and quarter by quarter and year by year what your revenue will look like. And our business models are so darn simple. We just have training sessions. So when you show a bank, here's how many sessions I'm going to be doing at the six month mark and the one year mark and the two year mark, et cetera. You simply count how many trainers is that going to be, and uh, then you understand, well, this is the location I need to be in. So if you don't have the resources, then you have the wrong business plan, or you need to go and secure the appropriate capital to be able to do that. And it's very common to be undercapitalized at the beginning, and sometimes our lack of capital at the beginning forces us, or we feel like it forces us, it compels us to make a poor strategic decision and that we sign uh, the wrong lease in the wrong size location. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's partly down to confidence and mindset, right? It, it is is someone just, you know, most I'm assuming most entrepreneurs probably just, um, well, I know most entrepreneurs probably don't think about strategy and longer term vision and what the business is going to look like. What are you building? It's more about what can I afford right now? Um, and then I guess, yeah, I mean, just, just to dive into that for a moment, I guess there's a number of ways you can approach that in terms of planning for that additional investment. It might be Obviously, the, the most obvious one is your own resources. Then there might be getting a, a loan from a bank. Could be getting a business partner who has the capital you require. Um, could be giving up some equity in a different way, maybe maybe with a, hey, a third party. Lawrence, Lawrence asked joining me, us. Lawrence asked me, um, when someone closes, uh, I know this is a live podcast, but when someone closes, <laughs> close, do they have to be at, they have closed within 30 days or 14 days? 30. 30 days. Yeah. And that's purely just from a competition. I, I got that part right. From our trainers. Okay. Yes. Hi, Hi. congratulations. <laughs> I can't believe you did that during live podcasting. That's totally off topic. But I'm sorry. Just... <laughs> it was a conversation we had before the topic started, so I apologize. Man. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's uh, the listeners. Well, they probably already know that I have the good fortune to talk to you a lot and I get to ask you all my random questions. I was actually asking Luke, how do they define sales conversion percentage? Because, um, you know, I was curious whether, because obviously a lot of people come come for an introductory session, might not convert on that day and, uh, and might convert, you know, a week later or two weeks later. And you told me, well, often we, you know, actually, sorry, what did you just say there? Because I've just completely forgotten what you just days, said. 30 days. Right. The reason we really have to know 30 days is because we're going to give a bonus to our sales team person if you close yes. them within 30 days. If someone becomes a client after 45 days, the sales team member doesn't get a bonus. That's a great, great point. And I love that, obviously, you you define that very clearly. And that makes me feel better about my conversion rate because lately I've not been converting within the session. And I was converting like 100% in the session. So uh, <laughs> so now I feel much better because I know I'm probably going to still be close to that uh, for myself uh, based on that time scale. So thank you for that. Um, so getting back to it. So I, I listed a few ways that people can acquire resources. And the last one I mentioned was about, you know, maybe contacting some third party, um, you know, presenting this business plan to some kind of venture capitalist or, um, you know, some third party that that is willing to invest that capital in your business. So there's a few routes you can take, but I think a lot of people are just very scared to do that, aren't they? The other thing you can do yeah. is you could do this in stages. And there's nothing wrong with that. You could say, well, I'm going to I'm gonna do a rifle shot to the studio. And uh, it's still a pretty big rifle shot. I'm going to open a smaller studio. I'm going to train all the clients. Maybe I'm going to have one trainer. I'm going to sh- assign a short-term lease. Maybe it's a year long. Maybe it's two years. I'm going to prove out the concept. And then I'm going to move to a different location that's in the same area. 
bring all those clients with, add some more square footage, add some more equipment. Um, and I'll have a little bit of a track record there where I could uh, borrow from a bank and it'd be much, uh, much easier. Or maybe I've made some money and I can actually expand with, um, with retained earnings. And that's a possibility also. I, I do want to be clear I that. that when I launched, I didn't think about any of that. So I just said, you got to have the strategy of knowing where you're going. I didn't, my only focus, you, you said a lot of times the entrepreneur is just a, a little bit risk averse and maybe they don't want to take that risk. That's probably true. I was too naive to even be risk averse. My only excitement was around, I just got to get open because I can't wait to train someone at Discover Strength. I didn't even think about what was the second month going to look like or the second week going to look like. I just thought, man, if I could get the medics like press here and if I could get this machine here um, and I could just train someone here, I bet you they'd get good results and they'd like it. And that's that was it. And then I, I started to deal with, well, hold on. I need another trainer in here and a, a third trainer and a fourth trainer and a fifth trainer. And we're doing group sessions. And I have nine group clients training at once while there's three one-on-ones going on at once. And this is kind of a tight space and et cetera. So our original location in 2006, we opened it and it was not nice. It was not a beautiful spot. Our equipment was beautiful. I mean, every single machine was a brand new machine, a brand new medics machine, Nautilus 2ST machine or hammer strength machine. So we had great equipment, but the facility was not great. I mean, myself and my business partner at the time painted the inside of the facility ourselves. And uh, I mean, we got it looking uh, presentable. And then we operated from 2006. And by 2010, we moved our location across the parking lot. They had built a new strip with a great coffee shop, two other tenants, and the other, the other um, uh, end cap space was wide open, windows all the way around. And I just begged them. I said, we need to go here. We need to go here. We need to go here for years. And they kept saying no. Well, they kept also not filling it. And it was the same landlord. They saw what our revenue was like in our current location. And then we we built that location out. And to date, that's still our most profitable location, our smallest location, our highest revenue location, our most profitable location, all of that. So can you just remind everyone the revenue for that location, if you don't mind revealing that? Yeah. So let's be really honest here. Um, pre-pandemic, we were at like $1.62 million in a year. And that's about a little over 1,400 square feet. Exercise floor is, geez, about 700 square feet. 700 um, square feet, everyone. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, go on. And, and now this year, so this is our first kind of full year post-pandemic. We just reviewed financials yesterday. So I, I should have a more accurate answer here. It's probably going to be about 1.2 million um, in revenue. And it's definitely lost revenue, not due to the pandemic, just due to that we've opened up a couple other locations that it's more convenient for our customer to go there. So side note, one of the metrics for us that's important is same store growth, right? Our revenue keeps going up, but if you open up more and more locations and your revenue goes up, is your revenue divided out by the number of locations you have actually going up? Because that that definitely matters, right? Are you just shifting clients from one location to another? So that, that location will still be well over a million dollars. It just, it's not going to be $1.6 million. Yeah, still so impressive. And and I love hearing you talk about that because I just think it's so inspiring. Well, I know it's it's very inspiring to me and a lot of the listeners. Um, and something I wanted to touch on, I don't know whether you agree with this, Luke, but you know, it's 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 important to note that you will not get this 100 percent right from the beginning and you will not get it perfect, but you have to take action. You need to execute. You and I were talking about the importance of execution before we got recording. So do you think that's um it's reasonable to say that, look, don't try and get everything perfect in the beginning. Yes, if you can get a larger space and without going into all of that, go for it. But don't worry necessarily that you're not, you know, you're not getting everything perfect in the beginning. I know it's a slightly different topic, but I just think reason I bring that up is because I think it can be quite paralyzing to hear you and I talk about some of this stuff because it's a lot to think about. And I just want the listeners to know that, you know, just get it 80% right and then just go for it. <laughs> so, so I don't know if I can say it any better than that. You, you stumbled upon this. Um, perfectionism is so often um, causes our paralysis, right? And so we don't take action because we want to get it perfect. And these are, this is what happens to really smart, planful, people, entrepreneurs and practitioners and so forth. So 
yeah, yeah, don't don't have this analysis paralysis and uh, caused by your desire to be perfect. And then understand that there's so many great data points of people that have had all different spaces and have made it work. And so, and we've seen uh, some of our great friends and colleagues and the people that have been on your podcast open a location and operate there for five years and then move to a different location. And sometimes it's moved to a bigger location. Sometimes it's moved to a smaller location, a location that fits for them. And I know we're really talking about the size of the location and those sizes have changed, but it could also be, you know, what do I want in terms of co-tenancy and where should the location, you know, be related to um, in relation to major thoroughfares Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we can actually get this wrong, uh, whatever wrong is. I'm using air quotes right now, and still get it massively right. I mean, our our first location on paper should not have worked in so many ways, and it was just a smash success. And in the middle of the great uh, great recession in uh, the U.S., right? We opened in 06, 07, 08. Things got bad, and our revenue kept growing and growing and growing. I remember getting in the argument with my family, saying we're not actually in a recession. You know, the media has lied to us. And then, you know, as time went on, I realized, okay, we're definitely in a recession. I just didn't know it because every week um, our revenue kept growing and we kept adding more clients. And it's hard to believe that you're in a recession when your own business is doing well. And what you're doing is definitely disposable income and people don't have to spend money on it and people are still spending money on it. Yeah. And, you know, just before I ask this question, when's your hard stop, Luke, today? How many, how much time do you have? I can go another 12 minutes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, let me just quickly ask that. And if you can ask answer this succinctly as you can, we'll jump to layout because I want to talk about layout briefly. So you've given me, you've teased me now with that. I have to, I have to follow up. So regarding marketing during the recession, um, you, you know, you said this to me before and, and you're, you're a great communicator, obviously. And, and you said this to me really well when I was, I was asking you about um, you know, a possible recession now and, and talking about COVID and the impact that might have on the economy and all the rest of it. And you talked about, it is in, by the way, if people want to hear the full podcast, it's about recovering your studio and, and I have it in the show notes. Um, but you talked about how, you know, people people should understand that, that, that their strength training is a 10x return on their health, for example. And it's, it's, it's messages like that that I think really work during a recession because you're looking for ways you can get the highest return in your, in your investments generally. Um, and I'm just curious, when you think back to that time when you were in a recession growing, do you remember why that was happening? And, and do you, is there any sort of cause and effect that you can talk about here in terms of specific marketing you did or things you noticed that really helped, that really helped you grow that business at that time? Everybody in our team would say the same thing. We were spending no money on marketing. Um, uh, I shouldn't say no money. We were all in BNI, right? So, so that is marketing, and that costs money. We were all in, in a BNI group. Every one of our trainers was in a BNI group. I was in a BNI group, and we had you know great attendance, and we all participated. And everybody was a president or a vice president or an education coordinator. You know, everybody was very active. Um, but beyond that, if you ask our team, we just talk about how do we improve the client experience nonstop. I mean, to the point where it's like, hey, we got to spend more time role playing handshakes and our professional greeting. We got to spend more time talking about what the transition looks like on a, you know, turnaround of a leg press. So we, that that's what we always thought is the more the better rep quality we had, the better positive and and constructive feedback we gave, um, the better our teaching and coaching was, the faster we were going to grow. So we spent like I, I like to sometimes go back to meeting agendas from like 08 and 09. And that's like what the meeting agenda was nonstop. It was just all of those things. And we did it every week. And we just talked about where are we weak? Where can we get stronger? What do we need to do better? But it was always internal. We never looked outside. We never said, what's the marketing event or campaign? Or can, you know, we would go to the Twin Cities Marathon. So there's a big marathon here in October every year. We'd go to that expo and have a booth and spend money on the booth. And we got a total of um, I'm giving a goose egg sign, zero clients out of, you know, seven years of going to that booth. And, but we always got more clients if we actually just provided a better workout experience. Now, now let's be totally clear. A better workout experience is unique to every one of your listeners, right? So what do you want your workout experience to be all about? And then just make sure that that's actually happening in your facilities. When we stray away from what we call our six first principles, our business suffers, right? If we're really executing on the six principles, if we're pouring ourselves into the six first principles, then uh, our business grows. And that's been the same 
in 2021. It's been the same in 2007 and 2008. Yeah, thank you for that. It's always so interesting. Um, and why am I not surprised that it was all about the the workout and the client experience? Yeah. You say it's um, interesting, but it's also you probably perceived as the most boring answer of all. <laughs> I don't know. I like it. I like simple. Google or whatever. So, uh, yeah. side note, you know, before our podcast started, we just said that uh, we had the best month in company history in July, highest revenue, most profit across all of our locations, and. Um, we were really excited about that. We just covered it on Wednesday. We're recording this on a Friday. And we also look at our marketing uh, spend as a percentage of revenue. We've never spent less money on marketing than we are right now. And so um, we're still spending money on marketing. We just are starting to understand what actually produces a return and then not spending a single dollar. And so that allows our revenue to grow and outpace the marketing that we're spending. So the percentage of revenue that's going to marketing is seemingly consistently shrinking yeah now that's um again super interesting and i actually do find that quite exciting um so we've got obviously a couple minutes i just want to talk about layout for a moment because obviously this is really important right in terms of how you lay your studio out the different compartments you know whether you've got an office and bathroom and concierge desk and then you've got the the workout area um and design interior is another thing as well. You know, how does the space look? What's the ceiling like? Is it a low ceiling, high ceiling, windows, etc.? cetera? Um, so do you want to just give maybe, I don't know, two or three things that you think are really important when considering layout? And we'll wrap up straight after that. So two or three things that really stick out to you that you think is really important for the listeners to, to, to you know, journal on and think about uh, before opening a studio. Yep. So number one is width. Um, so it's square footage is one thing, but I think width is 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 really important as well. So I the first thing I want to know anytime I go into the studio is what's the width? I look for over 21 or 22 feet in width. If it's 19 feet in width, I'm less excited about it. I'd rather be in a, a studio that has in excess of 22 feet in width. And I don't care if it's only 1,500 square feet. Our template is 2,000 square feet. We want our studios, we want our franchises to be 2,000 square feet. And of course, the first question we ask is, what's the width? It can be 2,000 square feet exactly. And if it's 19 uh, feet in width, we're not going to move forward with it. Um, but if it's 1,700 square feet and we have 24 foot width, we're going to move forward with it because we can fit three rows of equipment in and then you can actually move between the machines. And we know that we need to have more than one trainer on the floor and more than one client to the floor. And we think we compromise the experience if a client is, we don't, we don't subscribe to the ideal exercise environment. And if your listener does, that's, that's great. That's fine. Very familiar with it. Um, I just haven't seen any research that supports um, temperature, fans, uh, no music, quiet, no distractions, et cetera. Theoretically, I think it makes a tremendous amount of sense, right? Like I could care less about music in my own workout, right? But we don't have any research to say it's true. And if anything, if we really looked at the research, we might say ideal exercise environment, no distractions, no other people around you. There may be some literature that's saying other people around you causes social pressure and you actually elicit greater effort if there was people around you. So, so, and of course, if your listener it thinks that's a key compart, uh, component of their business, then 100% stick with that. We don't care about that. Um, but we do care about if you have multiple trainers and multiple clients in a facility at once, when they're walking by each other, just going from machine to machine, they can't feel like they're bumping and grinding, right? They have to feel like they can comfortably uh, move past you and I don't feel like I'm going to rub up against you. Or if we're doing like a body weight lunge and someone's on a machine, do they feel like they have enough space kind of in between and are they comfortable? So that's where we provide a, a potential compromised client experience is if the clients feel like they're maneuvering around each other at all times. That's that's I think that's a, a negative client experience that was great is there anything else from a layout perspective that you okay, so the other thing that we think is really important is windows so i think you can get away for i think you can get away with a uh, smaller smaller square footage if you have higher ceilings and you have windows so the three things i'm always going to look for is windows um, high ceiling and the width of at least 21 or 22 square feet so those are the top three the next one would be okay do i have enough common space here so do I have an, an, a transition space? You can call it a lobby, transition space, seating area. Do I have a small office for myself or for trainers? What do I want to do from a bathroom standpoint or a changing room standpoint? 
Now, I'll also say you don't make money in any of those areas, in my opinion. So I don't want, want elaborate back offices and uh, huge lobbies and you know, even changing room and bathrooms. Your clients realize, you realize pretty quickly, your clients aren't like showering and changing clothes in your facilities. Very small changing room, very small bathroom, as long as it's up to code should suffice. So I don't like to waste a lot of space in those areas, but our trainer still needs a space to, you know, um, uh, sit down at a desk and, and prepare workout cards and check email and things like that. Yeah. Sounds good. Luke, thank you so much. I know you need to, we need to wrap up because you've got other things going on and um, best way for people to find out more about you. And so they can go to discoverstrength.com, discoverstrengthfranchise.com. And just based on our timing here, they can definitely go to resistanceexerciseconference.com. We're going to be in Las Vegas at the end of October. We're recording this in the beginning of September right now. Uh, we have tremendous pre-registration. We have more sponsor involvement um, from some really interesting companies than we've ever had. So it's our first time in Las Vegas. So we are really excited about that. And we'd love for, um, for people to take a look at that. We're doing an operators roundtable. We're doing a keynote roundtable. Our keynotes are excellent. We're doing these rapid presentations with a heck of a lot of different people. So in all ways, we are really excited about REC. Awesome. Thank you for that, Luke. Sounds amazing. Um, and for everyone listening, if you would like more access to exclusive content from Luke Carlson on how to grow your strength training studio business, you should definitely join Hit Business Membership, where Luke is also a member over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash join. Um, and to find the blog post for this episode, uh, please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search for episode 333. And until next time, thank you very much for listening.